So of course this is very important because um, you you can have the best planned out program or or um, or service, and if the drivers or monitors do not follow the laws, uh, it, it it is for nothing, you know. So if the program is as good as the staff that is going to be operating it. Um, we're going to talk about bus safety features. According to the American School Bus Council, there are approximately 48,000 school buses in operation in the U.S. today, transporting 26 million children to and from school every day. The U.S. Department of Transportation and other authorities agree that school buses are the safest form of transportation for getting children to and from school. In fact, it is believed that school buses are 70 times safer, safer than personal autos. Uh, the school buses are, are built, uh, they scrutinize the school buses very much and they have a profound and uh, intensive program for a uh, safety program for the buses. Uh, school bus yellow and black paint screen, for example, is made is aimed at making school buses visible in morning and evening light as well as various kinds of storms, lighting, and traffic. Uh, if you have ever been in traffic and uh, way out, way out into the traffic area, you see a school bus, you can readily visualize it. I mean, you could just see it uh, very visible amongst all the other traffic, yellow and black. And, and that is a very special color scheme uh, for safety reasons. And of course, buses are equipped with other various features other than the paint and and equipment. So, uh, for example, you you look at the bus and you see three black black stripes on it, and those stripes there are for a purpose. They have a purpose. Uh, the stripes themselves they're constructed in such a way that they will absorb. Uh, a side impact and they are referred to as as rub panels or rub rails okay and if you see that the stripes are you have three of them one at the the very bottom of the uh, the very bottom stripe is where the floor level is the middle stripe is where the seat level is where the children or, or students sit and the top part is of course the top of the uh, the back of the uh, seat and those are placed there in case uh, in, in there's an incident or an or an accident, and the uh, first responders first responders want to get into the bus or they want to cut into the bus, they know exactly where those the seats are in proportion to the to the to the line to the black stripes. And of course, um, there are other features that you cannot see, uh, like the tank gas tanks. They are in cages, in steel cages. They are surrounded by steel cages, case cages, and of course that's to help in in case of an an uh, impact on on the gas tanks. It'll keep them from exploding. And um, one of the other features that they have that uh, people don't realize is that the windshield is an escape route. Is it is an emergency exit? They're designed to be kicked out of place. You kick them out and they rarely fall out. Uh, they are designed that way and for that particular purpose. And now moving on to the bus safety equipment. All safety equipment in buses is labeled and is responsibility of drivers and monitors to familiarize themselves of their location and use. Uh, all the equipment uh, that is in the bus uh, have labels on them. For example, you go up the step. There's a fire extinguisher right there by the steps, and it's got a, it, it has a label fire extinguisher. You look down and there's a first aid kit. It has a label. It is labeled first aid kit. And you look up further on the uh, somewhere on the dash, you shall see a um, seat belt cutter, and it's labeled. Uh, accordingly, you know, seatbelt cutter. So it is the responsibility for the driver and monitors to familiarize yourself as to their location or where they're exactly located in the bus. And 
in case of an emergency, in case you need to someday readily be able to, to access them, you know where they're at. You don't have to be looking for them anymore. Uh, you, know, ex you know exactly where to go. And of course you need to uh, familiarize yourself with the use, you know, you, for example, the uh, seatbelt cutter. Uh, its name says it all. You use it to seat, to cut the seat belts in case uh, the buckles are, are are jammed or you cannot uh, unbuckle the, the the seat from or the child from the seat. And uh, but you need to be able to learn or to know how to use it effectively. So those things that you you are responsible to to familiarize yourself with. Uh, all buses also uh, are equipped with two-way radio, which enables the communication between two or more persons. First aid kit is equipped with medical supplies for treating minor traumatic injuries. Uh, you know, very basic. Your band-aids, your antiseptic swabs, and gauzes, thermometer, tweezers, scissors, gloves, cotton balls. You know, just simple stuff for minor injuries. Uh, biohazard kits contains necessary supplies to pick up, sanitize, and dispose of bodily, bodily fluids. Uh, eventually, it, and it, it'll happen not very often, but a child will start uh, throwing up in the bus. Maybe he got seasick, I mean, car sick, motion sickness, uh, for whatever reason. And you have this kit that contains the necessary reply, supplies to address that issue, that particular issue. You know, it has gloves, it has a, a, a sack in which to put uh, all the, um, the biohazard uh, <clears throat> pathogens in there and um, so that you can dispose of them properly and uh, all things of that nature. Uh, flashlight is a handheld device for illumination and or signaling, of course, you know, you Eliminate with a flashlight and you can use it as a signal also. Seat belt cutters, as we already discussed, uh, they're used to cut belts or harnesses in the event of an emergency. A fire extinguisher is a portable canister used to put out fires and uh, you need to familiarize another, uh, you know, another example, you need to familiarize yourself with how to use this fire extinguisher, you know, it's there. You take it off the cradle, crater, cradle, and it's got a pin. You pull out the pin. You aim the hose at the base of the fire, and you pull the trigger. As simple as that. And you sweep the base of the fire, and uh, to turn off the extinguish the flames. Okay. Uh, we also have emergency reflectors, which are highly visible light reflecting triangles that are set out in front and behind buses to alert traffic. Uh, you, you've all seen them. Um, you have, uh, you've seen uh, uh, semi trucks parked on the side of the road, whether they got a flat or they're got a mechanical problem. You see those bright orange triangles placed strategically behind the, the vehicle. And that's to alert you or the traffic that there's an issue with it and they're highly visible during the day and even at night uh, they're very reflective so they're highly visible both day and night all buses have emergency exits which are clearly labeled with the red letters well not necessarily red letters either black or red letters but definitely they all have red handles okay uh, that are utilized to open up uh, the doors and readily identified uh, throughout uh, the year, throughout the school year, we're going to have uh, emergency evacuation drills and you will be familiarizing yourself with all where the emergency exits are, how to open, how to close, you know, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, all buses are equipped with age, weight, and size appropriate child seat restraints. Um, uh, the children or our kids don't just go in and sit on the bus on the bench seat, as you call them, that uh, come from the factory. Uh, we install <coughs> some 
alternate seating there. We put some, you can call them a booster seat, sort of like a booster seat. And they are strapped into the bench seat. And uh, <clears throat> we put the child in there, adjust the straps, adjust the harnesses and buckle the child in. And they they fit pretty nice. They're pretty snug in there. And they're not they're not going anywhere if it's, they're used correctly. All the bus, also all the buses have what we call a backup alarms. It's an, an alarm uh, apparatus that when you put the bus in reverse, it, it, it um, emits a high pitch or a high sound uh, notifying everyone that the bus or it, it is in uh, reverse and it is backing up. Okay, uh, documentation forms. It is vital that all forms are filled out correctly for documentation. First of all, the pre, post, the pre and post route bus inspection form, it's a form that is required by law and is most important for safety reasons. Now the bus driver is uh, the one that's mostly or mostly responsible for the filling out this form. He carries on a multi-point inspection of the bus before and after each route. Before he moves the bus in the morning, he needs to go through this inspection form. <clears throat> Oil, water, gas, batteries, um, tires, horn, mirrors, and particularly make sure that all the warning lights are operating properly. The uh, signal lights, uh, hazard lights, the emergency lights, uh, the loading and unloading uh, hazard lights, all these must be in proper order. Um, if something is not right with the bus, it cannot be moved until it, they are repaired. <clears throat> but uh, it is, uh, if it's not a safety issue with the bus, you know, it, it, it's, if, uh, for example, if the red, uh, the flashing red lights are, are not operating, that is a big issue. That is a big safety issue. And the bus cannot be moved until it is repaired. Or if um, they have, we have what we call clearance lights. We have three on the very top of the bus, in front, in back, in the side. Uh, for example, if one of those three lights way up on the bus is the red light, one of them is not turning on, it is not a back, big safety issue. The, the bus can definitely be moved. So it, it's up to the driver to determine if the bus is in a safety operating mode or if it, or it, if it, it isn't, okay? The travel log, it is a daily, uh, it's a document used daily to uh, document the miles traveled by the buses, you know. Um, and it is filled out with every trip, starting mileage, ending mileage after every trip. Okay. <clears throat> bus roster is a record of children present in each route. Uh, the bus roster is uh, exactly that. It, it, it's the driver has to fill out the names or the 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 children that are assigned to that particular route, whether it be the morning or afternoon route or noon route. Okay, and um, they're listed on, he lists them on this log, on this roster, and from there he it, it determines how many children will be present on each route. Uh, the sign in, and out, sign in and out form is to document custody of the child. That is a, this is a very important form. Uh, it is used to document uh, exactly that, the custody of the child. When the parent, when you go up to pick up the child in the morning, um, and the parent signs the child in, she, he or she is turning custody of that child over to you. She signs him in, and now it's saying, hey, okay, I'm, I'm trusting my child to you, and please you're responsible for him please take very good care of my child you know and he is our 
responsibility from that point on okay and so that is what that form is about so it, it's very important that they sign that form when they're turning they're uh, turning the custody of the child over to you a medical form is used to document any physical issues with the child uh, uh, medical issues or physical issues I'm, I'm referring to maybe uh, a bruise a scratch a cut bite mark anything that uh, you can physically ascertain that the child has issues with okay and this is very important because if you don't do it in the morning when you see the child if you say no nah, no it's not it's just a little bit it's just a little scratch even the parents might say oh it's nothing it's just a scratch okay in the afternoon when you take them back home that parent might take a different view of, of, of the scratch or the bruise and say what happened here you know he didn't have that in the morning when you took him and then you're gonna it's gonna be yes he did but if you did not document it you know it's gonna be a problem because she's gonna, the parents gonna say he didn't have it and you say you had it so avoid those types of situations it will happen people it will happen and I know it has happened when you know uh, the monitor or the age is not it's just a little bit even the parent agrees and then it becomes a great issue or a bigger issue t throughout the day so please avoid that situation fill out the form it does not take long and uh, protect yourself you know be sure to document it. okay a black box it's carried in the bus and contains all required route forms the bus driver uh, is responsible for this box he has all the pertinent forms that are required for the for the route the uh, sign in and out sheets uh, the travel logs the medical forms uh, the authorization forms which we'll discuss a little later uh, you know everything uh, the uh, pre and post trip inspection all the necessary forms are in that box okay it it also has a medical record uh, for the child you know uh, uh, the medical history you know who's the doctor any does he have any allergies or you know does he have any reaction to any type of, of uh, medication it's all there it's all in the box and it's all confidential so the bus driver puts it in the bus in the morning takes it out in the afternoon when the, the when the day is over and puts it in the center it is, it is sensitive information in there also okay I'm sorry I got ahead of myself there a little bit route safety establishing a dedicated primary route all the centers have transportation services they must establish a route and that's the route they're going to be using every single day to go going to pick up the children and coming back to the center and this route has to be established both by the driver and manager they take the name of the children the address and they 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 establish a route which is the quickest and the safest route to take to pick up the children and come back safely to the center okay once this route is established once it uh, says this is the route we're going to take it cannot they cannot deviate from this route it's got to be done on a daily basis same route every day uh, you know the driver can't wake up one morning and say no nah, I'm gonna go this route I'm gonna go this way instead because uh, I'm, I'm bored of going the same way every day no they cannot do that it has to be the same route every single day uh, using an alternate route due to a rising hazards conditions <clears throat> is appropriate uh, if on the primary route you have a bridge that is out you can use an alternate route and you, that can be established if there's rising water uh, there's a low area 
and it floods, you have to use an alternate rod. You can go around that. It's no problem as long as uh, the manager knows which rod you're taking. Uh, if there's an accident or any mitigating circumstance coming up, and uh, in order, if it's going to cause a safety issue, you need to take an alternate route. Okay. Okay. And when establishing or developing the route, um, the the door or the service door, that's a door uh, where you get on and off in the bus. It must be facing the pickup address. Okay. We do not allow a child to cross the street. Okay. Even if it takes driving an extra block or two and, and, and maneuver the bus around the block and coming back to make sure that the door is towards the, uh, towards the pickup address, it needs to be done. Okay. Now, that is why no child is allowed to cross the street to board the bus. That's the reason why the door has to be towards the address. No child can be picked up before 7 a.m. Okay. Uh, the route can start before 7. It can start at 6.45. It take, if it takes time, if it takes 15 minutes to get to the first child that you're going to pick up, you know, no problem. But you cannot pick up the child before 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay? So the furthest child from the center is picked up first. And... Um, this is to eliminate or, or to make uh, make it possible or have the children spend the last time, the least time amount, of, the least amount of time on the bus uh, during the route. Okay. Uh, no child can be on a route longer than one hour. Consistent route times are important. It is important that the route is started every day at the same time. Okay, because we have a time limit as to which how long the bus can can last at a, or, or remain at a bus stop. Okay, uh, if you don't have consistent times, if if you show up at the at 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 a house 17 at 17 in the morning, and then the next day you show up at 7, the next day you show up at 7:20. The parent will not have a, a uh, consistent time frame into which have the child during which she can have the child ready to be picked up. Okay, so she might say, "Oh, you know, yesterday they came at 7:20. Uh, I think I'll, you know, I have till that time to. It's okay if I don't have them ready by then till 7:20. But if you're there consistently at the same time every day, 17, 17, 17 a.m." Uh, they will be ready most of the time by that time and it makes it easier to uh, cut the amount of time that children spend in the bus during the route okay so consistent route times are important because the bus cannot wait longer than one minute at any house or at any pickup point Okay, route safety continued. The law requires everyone to remain seated while the bus is in transit. Okay, once the bus gets going, nobody can get up from their seats and move around the bus, except for the monitor if she or he is tending to a child that requires assistance. That's if the child unbuckles himself and is trying to standing up and trying to move from one seat to another, the uh, monitor is allowed to get up and, and, and deal with that situation. Okay, so that's the only exception. Okay, while well, on the route, of course, where all the bus is moving, the monitor needs to assist the driver uh, with the uh, like at, at the railroad crossing by keeping the children quiet okay the driver the monitor also needs to be on the lookout or help the drivers uh, you know be on the lookout for traffic uh, 
or or objects on the road you know you, you can see down the road and he says oh you know there's something on the road be careful or you know alerting the driver helping him uh, run a safe route <clears throat> okay uh, when coming to a railroad crossing you know it's a good learning opportunity for the children you know you can you can talk to them about the importance of uh, crossing safely across the tracks you know like a okay we're going to be quiet because we're going to have to stop we're going to have to look and we're going to have to listen for the train okay so everybody be quiet uh, we need to stop um, the driver's going to open the window the driver's going to open the door so so he can hear and he's going to look both ways and and before crossing he may, has to make absolutely sure there there is not a train coming you know so things of that nature you need to talk to the children about to make sure the importance of of, of that of doing that and of course uh another thing that i'm going to mention it again you need to familiarize yourself with bus bus evacuation procedures it is very essential okay it's better to know the plan better to practice the plan better to practice the procedures with plenty of time before you actually are in the middle of an emergency because once you're in an emergency you know it's too late to practice you know oh what am i going to do this i forgot What's the next step? What do I need to do? What do I need to tell the children? Things of that nature. But if you learn yourself on these procedures, if you learn these procedures before you get into the actual emergency, which it's rare and hopefully you never do, but it might happen. That way you are prepared. Of course, even if you're prepared, uh, you know, if it's a dire emergency, if it's uh, a fire or a, or an accident, you know, you never know how you're going to respond people never know how they're going to respond but you're ahead of the game if you know what you need to be doing okay so it's very important um there's a, a there's a videos i listed there that you can see i hope you turn them on and uh, you know it talks about bus evacuation procedures. It, uh, the other one is the procedures about railroad crossing. And the third one is the operator life, operation lifesaver also at railroad crossing. It is very important. I mean, there's, I cannot emphasize the importance of being careful at railroad crossings. Um, those, those are very informative. So take the time to watch them. Uh, in order to watch them, I put a note there, click on the control button, I mean, push down on the control button and and uh, put the cursor on the title and click on it, then it should start the video. Hi, I'm Sharon Hendricks. Millions of students take the bus to school in North America, and it's a safe way to go. In fact, the numbers show that it's much safer than traveling by car. But of course, emergencies do happen, and they sometimes require a quick evacuation of the bus. That's what we'll talk about today. We'll see how you can prepare yourself and your students for the unexpected and help keep everyone safe. Now, the first question to consider is when do you evacuate? The answer, only when absolutely necessary. Remember, there are situations where your kids will be much safer staying on the bus. For example, if you break down but can pull well off the roadway. There are times, however, when you may have to act quickly and evacuate. If your bus is stopped and is in danger of being hit, like on the shoulder in heavy fog, or just over a hill. If you're stranded on a railroad grade crossing, or if there's fire or danger of fire. Now, not all situations will be this clear cut. Maybe you've pulled over after a minor accident, 
or you're stalled near a hill or cliff, a threatening body of water, a hazardous spill, here's what should guide you. If the danger is increased by staying on the bus, it's time to get your kids out. Next question, which way out? I'm sure you know, buses come in many different exit configurations. There are front doors in combination with back doors or side doors. There are wheelchair lifts, exit windows, and roof hatches. We'll look at each of these so that you'll be prepared to quickly choose the safest way out of your bus and then successfully evacuate your kids. But first, here are several things you can do in advance that will help you be fully prepared for emergencies. As a part of your regular pre-trip inspection, check exit latches. Make sure they can be opened easily. Check the placement and condition of your safety equipment. Keep an updated list of students that ride your bus. And learn how to get to exits by counting seats. In a bus filling with smoke, you may not be able to see the exits. Also, remember that once your bus is loaded, you should make sure exits are never blocked by things like musical instruments and athletic equipment. And, as we'll soon see, you'll need to pick kids to be helpers and leaders who will be able to assist with the evacuation. Make sure they're sitting near the exits and don't pick kids who are last on or first off. Okay, one last thing before we get going. In the event of an emergency evacuation, you'll need to remain as calm as possible. Remember, your kids will only be calm and controlled if you are. Anyway, planning and practice are the keys and that's why we're here today. First, let's look at a set of actions you need to perform quickly and automatically right before any evacuation. Once you've made the decision to evacuate, you should turn on your hazard lights, put the bus in gear or in park, set the parking brake, and turn the key to accessory or remove it. Then, call in the emergency if you have a two-way radio, providing whatever information your district requires. And, if your district allows it, drop the radio mic and your first aid kit out the window for later use. This sequence of actions should be automatic, and again, practice is the key. Okay. Now it's time to get your kids safely out. Face your students and in a calm but strong voice, announce the evacuation. Attention students are going to have a front door evacuation. Helper, I need you to take your position outside. Direct your helper to get in position just outside the door, ready to help small kids off the bus. Okay. Then, instruct your leader where to take the kids. Pick a spot at least 100 feet or 30 meters away from the bus and safely away from traffic. Then position yourself facing the front of the bus and release the kids one seat at a time, beginning with the front right seat. In a calm voice, tell them to walk and not push, and remind them to leave all their lunch boxes and knapsacks behind. And for safety at the door, instruct the kids to use the handrail and smaller kids to take the helper's hand as they exit. Throughout the evacuation, you'll also have to keep an eye on kids already out of the bus. They should be following the leader, single file to the designated safe waiting area, and the leader should see to it that no one wanders off. Once you've released the last kids, start at the rear and inspect every seat as you move to the front, checking for any remaining kids. On the way out, grab your student list and any necessary safety equipment. Place reflectors to protect the scene and then join your students at the safe waiting area. Finally, keep everyone together as a group until assistance arrives. Now what about the question of speed? How fast do you need to evacuate? Well, you don't want to rush. That invites accident and injury. But having said that, you and your kids have to learn how to get out as quickly as possible while maintaining safety. Remember that while many evacuations may be controlled, you have no control over a fire or approaching train. You may have two minutes or less to empty your bus and get your kids to safety. Something to think about as you plan for and practice your evacuations. Okay, now let's look at a rear door evacuation. All the basic principles of the front door procedure apply. However, your release of students is conducted from the rear of the bus. 
and the height of the rear door requires extra caution. Once again, in a calm but strong voice, announce the evacuation. Students, I need your attention. We're going to do a rear door evacuation. I need you to remain calm. Move to the rear door and have two student helpers open and go out the emergency door, followed by your student leader. This time you direct the students to exit from your position at the rear of the bus, beginning with the right rear seat. You may want to help some of the students sit and scoot. Sit on the edge of the bus and scoot out, with the assistance of the helpers if needed. Doing this makes for the shortest jump down. Once again, you should check carefully for any remaining students. Grab your student list and any necessary safety equipment, place your reflectors, and then join your group at the safe waiting area. And one other thing, to evacuate a bus that's filling with smoke, your students will need to know that they must stay low, below the smoke, and feel their way to the exit. When are two doors better than one? When the speed of the evacuation is very important and both exits are safe to use. You'll need to set a dividing line, and you may want to mark this in advance with tape. Move to the dividing line and have the students toward the front begin their evacuation out the front door. Then move to the rear exit and assist students sitting behind the dividing line as they evacuate out this door. And remember, to do this you'll need helpers and leaders for both exits, with the leaders directing the kids to the same safe waiting area. Front doors? back doors, side doors. You have several options for getting out. But in a worst case scenario, like a bus on its side, these exits might be blocked. So where are you gonna go? Check this out. It's a roof with a view. Most newer buses have escape hatches like this one, and they can be a lifesaver. However, there are many kinds, so know how yours works and show your kids how to open it. They should know how to get out of this and every exit by themselves, just in case you're not able to help them. There's still one other way out, the windows. Some buses are even equipped with special emergency window exits. Now, your district may not want you to practice a window exit, but you should still make sure your students know they can use windows if necessary. There are windows that flip open horizontally and vertically that helpers may need to hold open during an evacuation. You'll need to show your students how the ones on your bus work. Show them how the windows release and how helpers assist. How to ease out feet first. How they could step on the bus molding for support. And what they would do to safely drop to the ground. Also, if you drive a rear engine bus, show your kids how to open and secure the rear hatch. This is another important way out if the bus is on its side. And as a last resort, on many buses the front windshield can be kicked out or punched out with the fire extinguisher. Your students can then slide down the front of the bus with assistance from the student helpers. Well, we've covered a lot of information, but it all comes down to three key points. First, know your bus. Know how to get to every exit by counting seats if you have to, and make sure that you and your kids know how to operate every exit mechanism without hesitation. Second, know your kids. Keep an up-to-date list of students that ride your bus and any special requirements they may have. And choose responsible helpers and leaders and instruct them carefully. And finally, Plan ahead for different kinds of emergencies and practice. Following your district's guidelines, you should practice with your kids to the point where you're all comfortable with every evacuation procedure and where they could perform an evacuation without you if it was necessary. I hope you'll never be faced with an on-the-road emergency, but with a little practice, I'm confident you'll always be ready for the unexpected. Thanks for your time and have a safe school year.
Yes, we gotta be quiet again before we get over the railroad track. The decisions you make as a school bus driver affect the safety of your passengers. Nowhere are the right decisions more important than at railroad crossings. There's a lot going on inside and outside of a school bus at rail crossings. Extra precautions must be taken to decide smart and arrive safe. Everyone has driven a car across railroad tracks and not given it much thought. But driving a school bus is different. You are entrusted with the lives of children. Their safety is a top concern. School buses must stop before crossing the tracks, even if there's no indication a train is coming. Cal Lamont is a school bus safety advocate who goes around the country training bus drivers. The most important safety device on any school bus is the school bus driver. And making smart decisions is an individual choice that every driver makes every time that he or she gets behind that wheel. Let's take a look at signs and signals and what they mean. The advanced warning sign is usually the first sign you see when approaching a highway rail crossing. It's located a good distance ahead to allow a school bus driver to slow down and prepare to stop before reaching the crossing. Pavement markings consist of a railroad crossing symbol followed by a stop line. The stop line identifies the place nearest the tracks for you to stop. If there is no stop line, you are required to stop no closer than 15 feet and no farther than 50 feet from the nearest track. A cross buck sign marks all highway rail grade crossings. It means yield for most vehicles, but for school buses, it means stop. In addition to a cross buck, a stop or yield sign may also be included. No matter what the other signage is displayed, when a school bus approaches a cross buck, stop. Some rail crossings have a cross buck with flashing red lights and bells. School bus drivers should treat it like a stop sign. And when the lights begin to flash, do not cross. A train is coming. Many crossings have gates with flashing lights and bells. The gates are used to close the road when a train approaches. You must not go until the gates are completely raised and the lights go off. If there is more than one track, a sign below the cross buck will tell you the number. Make sure all tracks are clear before crossing. There are a wide variety of railroad crossing situations in terms of both the signs and signals and the layout of the crossing. School bus drivers should always expect a train and be aware that state laws and signage may vary with regard to highway rail grade crossings. It may take longer and be inconvenient, but finding an alternate route that avoids railroad tracks is the safest way to go. And just because you don't have any railroad crossings in your district doesn't mean you won't ever cross them. Busing kids to sports games and other activities may take you over a railroad crossing. So when you get to a railroad crossing, it's important to have a game plan and to know what to do. That's why Operation Lifesaver developed a series of safety steps called Five Alive. Five Alive, step one, prepare to stop. It all starts with our first sign, the advanced warning sign. When you see the advanced warning sign, slow down, prepare to stop, and alert other vehicles of your intentions by tapping on the brakes and turning on the hazard lights. Step two, quiet. Alert the students for quiet by flashing the dome lights, making an announcement. I'm approaching railroad crossing, I need silence. Using a noise suppression switch turning off radios and fans. Quiet on board your bus will help you hear the train's horn and focus your attention as you check for a train. Quiet signals vary from school district to school district. Step three, stop, open window and door. Stop between 15 to 50 feet from the tracks or at the stop line. 
open the window and door and look both ways down the tracks. Avoid obstructed views, poles, mirrors, window posts by leaning forward or backward in your seat. Step four, double take. Do a double take by looking quickly again in both directions before crossing the tracks. And step five of the Five Alive drill, go. If no train is in sight, cross the tracks. If you're driving a manual transmission, do not shift gears and risk stalling on the tracks. If you see a train coming from either direction, do not cross. You cannot accurately judge a train's speed or distance. An optical illusion may make the train seem farther away and slower moving than it actually is. This train appears to be creeping along and suddenly it's at the crossing. Don't take a chance, wait. Obstructed views can prevent drivers from seeing down the tracks at stop lines. Sometimes it's a matter of inching up past a pole or tree. Let's see what this school bus instructor recommends to her new driver. And this is where you have obstruction and you will need to rock and roll. Listen. And proceed. If you can't see safely down the tracks in both directions, talk to your supervisor. Contact railroad or highway authorities and ask them to remove the obstruction. Beware of getting too close to the tracks or a train may clip you. Trains overhang by at least three feet on each side of the tracks. Leave plenty of room for a train's overhang. When the five alive steps aren't followed, disaster can strike. Buffalo, Montana, 1998. The school bus driver had completed most of the Five Alive steps and was about to cross when a student asked the driver a question about some music. The distracted driver answered the student, then crossed without looking down the tracks a second time. A train struck the school bus, killing two brothers. In that particular situation, that driver was interrupted by a child and did attend to the child. It, it had to do with a cassette player. But the problem was that the driver did not go back and scan all of the stimuli that he had to look at at that moment. It is going back and reviewing all the systems that are going on to make sure that nothing has changed. Because as a driver, things can change in nanoseconds. And that was, that was the fatal error. Don't be distracted at railroad crossings. If you're interrupted, start your Five Alive safety steps again. Fox River Grove, Illinois, 1995. A substitute school bus driver unfamiliar with the rail crossing started across multiple tracks. Unbeknownst to the driver, when the light turned red on the other side, there wasn't enough room for the bus to clear the tracks. As the train approached, three feet of bus extended over the tracks. Inside the school bus, the radio noise drowned out both the train's horn and students' warnings about the oncoming train. They all ran to the front of the bus to get out of the way. The impact killed seven students. All of that would not have happened if this particular driver had been able to spend some time figuring out, do I have enough room to move this 40-foot bus so that it's going to clear the tracks? Many errors were made at Fox River Grove. When traffic lights and railroad crossings are in close proximity, there's always the potential that traffic may back up, not leaving enough room for a school bus to fit on the other side. Don't cross the tracks unless there is plenty of room on the other side. This space is called containment or storage. Take into account a train's three feet overhang from the tracks and your bus's length. Well, I think it's important not for the bus driver just to know the length of the bus, but the bus driver has got to walk the length of that bus prior to ever beginning uh, a route, meaning that there is a visual acquaintance that the driver has with that machine. And I think most drivers, after walking around the bus and physically getting accustomed to it, are going to be able to make smart decisions on the basis of what they have seen. With the light red and traffic waiting, this bus driver made the smart decision to wait before crossing. 
School bus drivers are being trained to have at least 15 feet of clearance once they cross the tracks. How would you avoid the mistakes at Fox River Grove? Run your route before carrying students across it. Review containment areas to determine when you can cross safely. Eliminate excess noise at the crossing to hear the train. If you have a containment area on your route that will not safely hold your bus, ask to adjust your route. And finally, contact your supervisor on how to deal with it. Conestoga, Tennessee, 2000. A school bus driver from Murray County, Georgia, failed to stop at a crossbuck after turning the bus around in a parking lot on the Georgia-Tennessee line. Here's how a local newscast described it. The impact of the collision ripped the school bus off of its chassis, dragging it down the tracks, throwing the driver and some of the seven children out, sounding to nearby residents like an exploding bomb. I helped pull a small girl, I believe it was a blonde-headed girl from the bus that had massive head injuries. Three children were killed. The driver's daughter, also a passenger on the bus, was severely injured. An onboard camera caught the driver failing to stop. The driver had been ignoring the crossbuck for some time since a train was never running. When a bus driver believes that he or she has got this route down, and I know that there are not going to be any trains, uh, that's the time that the driver is setting himself, herself up for disaster. You always go in to a crossing assuming that there will be a train and take the necessary steps. Savannah, Georgia, 2005. Four children were put in harm's way by their school bus driver. Bells were ringing, warning lights flashing, and the gates were down when the unthinkable happened. With a train approaching, the bus driver had four kids get off the bus to lift the crossing arm so the bus could proceed. A mother saw the whole thing. The conductor is screaming out the windows at the children to get out of the way. With the train bearing down, the kids crossed over the tracks in front of the train to get back on the bus. They could have died. The train was so close. The school bus driver was immediately fired. Right before that, another bus came through and was doing the zigzag through to get through those lights. Gates are blocking an intersection for a reason. A train is coming. Never lift the crossing arms. Never go around a gate. Contact the police or bus dispatcher if you feel there's a problem. The more you know about trains, the more cautious you'll be around railroad crossings. Here's a few train facts. It can take a mile or more to stop a train given its weight and size. Trains don't have steering wheels. They can't swerve. Trains are much bigger and heavier than buses. 400 loaded school buses would equal one loaded train. You have your uh, route all copied for you. We need to go over this route. Um, Before heading off with a loaded bus of kids, know your route. Know where the railroad crossings are. Drive your route and copy down the emergency notification number and the U.S. Department of Transportation identification numbers at your crossings. The posted numbers can take various shapes and sizes. Keep these phone numbers with you on the bus. Also give a copy to your dispatcher. If there's a problem at a crossing, you can provide the coordinates and the number to the dispatcher. As you scout your route, plan for an evacuation in the event your school bus gets stuck on the tracks. Determine an evacuation safe spot away from the tracks. This evacuation area is ideally at a 45 degree angle from the tracks and the direction of the train. Never cross a live track. Here's the evacuation drill. Scout and plan for an evacuation. Get the students safely out of the bus to the evacuation area. Call your dispatch office and give them the crossing numbers. In planning your route, make a list of the safety concerns. Work with your supervisor on resolving them. The safety of your passengers comes first. Each day, millions of... Okay. Now we are on the process of conducting a safe and successful route.
the most dangerous times during a school bus ride I repeat the most dangerous times are while loading and unloading students these are the times that most of the students get hurt injured or even killed you know it's during this this time this particular time uh, for very many reasons uh, the bus is stopped it's got the red flashing lights you know a a driver is not paying attention to what he's doing he might be on the phone he might be texting or he just you know not all there and that's when kids get hit by a car or by traffic you know they might be crossing the street or the guy runs into the bus and and that's that those are the times that are dangerous or the child is getting off the bus and he drops a paper the paper blows under the bus and he goes in to retrieve it the driver doesn't see it or doesn't see him and there that's an accident or the driver is not paying attention the child is not completely out of the bus and he closes the door snags his backpack snags a, anything uh, his arm or whatever and there you go you know he drags the child so they these are the most dangerous times and these are the times that we need to pay the most attention to what's going on okay on approach to the bus stop the driver must activate the yellow warning lights at least 300 feet from the stop okay 300 feet from the stop okay uh, this will alert all traffic that the bus is about to come to a stop okay and that means they're about to either pick up the children or drop some children drop some children off so this will alert all traffic okay at this particular point the driver and monitor must look out for potential hazards while at the stop okay or is all the traffic stopped what's around the bus what's in the immediate area if there's a strange looking fellow down the down the road a few feet or are there any dogs you know that might cause uh, a, a the monitor to have problems you know uh, dogs are very dangerous and some are very vicious uh, things of that nature you need to look out for okay and of course uh, the driver and monitor must ensure all traffic has stopped before initiating loading procedures they must make sure that no one enters the danger zone okay the danger zone is an area all around the bus which is uh, I would say 10 feet around the bus if anybody gets into that next to the bus it is very difficult for the driver to see that person or to see that area okay so especially in the afternoon when you're dropping off some kids you know uh, their siblings waiting for for the child for the head start child and they might uh, get close to the bus or they might go to the front of the bus and start start looking at the at the butterflies that are stuck to the grill and if the driver doesn't see that you know it's an accident waiting to be happen uh, waiting to happen so yes it's very important to be aware of everything that's going around the bus while at the stop sign, at the <clears throat> at the bus stop okay and again make sure nobody enters the danger zones okay so the monitor must get off the bus to conduct the child loading procedures okay it is always best to get out of the bus that way you have better control of the child better control of uh, you can supervise him better uh, when he's getting up on the bus plus uh, right now we're doing uh, we're using COVID procedures okay uh, you have to get off the bus and ask questions you need to take the child's temperature uh, you need to ask the parent if he has been or the child has been around anybody who has tested positive for COVID or has exhibited any symptoms of COVID or if the child ha 
has a cough or had the child been okay for the for the evening you know and you must uh, determine whether he is okay to go ahead and put him in the bus and take him to the center so you the monitor has to get off and do these things now when the child is getting up on the bus uh, <clears throat> You must instruct them. You must tell them that you. You must teach him that he needs to use the handrails on the steps, okay? And that must be that must become a habit for each and every child that's getting on the bus. Use the handrail. It'll keep them from tripping and hurting themselves on the steps. Okay, because they will trip. And they will hurt themselves. So, holding on to the handrail is very important. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the you must have a parent or authorized person to sign in and out cheat before boarding the child. Okay. Uh, when that parent signs that cheat, he is signing the child over to you. Okay. Once that parent signs that signing in and out cheat. They're saying here, here's my child, you're responsible for him, take good care of him, okay? And he's ours for the day. So, you can say he, we're going to have to take care of him and we're going to have to look out, take good care of him. And uh, hopefully, I'm sure everything will be okay on the most part. But when they sign that piece of paper they're turning the custody over to you so you are responsible now you know for my child okay so that uh, when you have them board up uh, get in the bus and right now uh, we're using uh, COVID procedures okay do I have to skip this this slide here we're going to be discussing uh, on the conducting conducting a successful route okay uh, when you are picking up the child uh, uh, we talked about a uh, medical form that is in the in the bus or that it's in the that is carried in the bus. Now you need to visibly check the child for cuts, bruises, sc scratches, you know, ex and fill out the form, the medical form if necessary. It is important that you do this uh, in order to protect yourself, in order to avoid problems later on during the day. Uh, you have to look for these things on the child you know you have to ascertain visibly if he's got bruises or bite marks or, or what have you you know on the child uh, if you don't document it in this form you might come back in the afternoon and the and the parent or guardian or whoever is responsible for receiving the child is going to say what happened to him you know he didn't have that this morning you know did you know what happened to him at the center and if you did not document it in the morning uh, you're gonna have you're gonna have a few problems there because parents do get very upset sometimes with any little minor thing that happens to the child and you know and if you're a parent you should know how it how how it is so if you see any cuts any bruises any scratches on the child document it fill out the medical form it'll save you problems down the road okay later on during the day and uh, protect yourself okay and of course it's, you need to check for these things also not just to protect yourself but to make sure that there's nothing on, nothing going on with the child at the house, you know. If you see bruises on the child every day, if you see scratches every day, every day uh, he comes up with something, you know, it's a red flag. Something might be going on. Something might be going on at the house, so that you need to make people aware of. Okay. All right. Next is uh, absolutely no food and drinks or toys are allowed to be on the bus okay for more than one reason 
no food. Uh, the most important is that the if the child gets on the bus, eating some food or eating a hard candy or eating anything, you know, should the bus the, the bus driver make a sudden stop and the child quit flashes back and forth, <clears throat> he runs a risk of choking. Okay. Uh, and believe me, believe me, you do not want to go through that trauma of having a child that is choking in the bus. Okay. So no food in the bus. That, which is very important, uh, you don't you don't need that to happen. Uh, you, you need to start. You need to tell them that you they need to keep the bus clean. Okay. The bus needs to be clean. No, it's their bus. Tell them it's their bus, and that we need to keep our bus clean. You know, no papers, no food on the floor, or things of that nature. To avoid all that, no food in the bus, and you you avoid yourself all that problem. Okay, drinks, same reason. You know, um, spills. They get the they get the seats dirty. They get their floors messy, and, and pretty soon. Uh, they, it's going to be a dirty bus, um, and it's more work for the driver. <coughs> so yes, no food, no food or drinks in the bus. Toys, depending on the size of the toys, if they have, they can carry a toy uh, that's sizable. In an accident, they will not be able to hold on to the toy. That toy is going to go and act as a missile. It's going to go somewhere else other than his hands, and it's going to hurt somebody. Okay, so no toys are allowed on the bus. Uh, that and uh, if they're allowed to take the toys to the center, it will probably cause a problem during the day, especially if it's a neat toy. You know, pretty soon uh, somebody's going, somebody else is going to want it, and they're going to try, try to take it away from them, and you're going to have a fight on your hands at the center. So no toys. Uh, uh, there are plenty of toys at the center from which they can play with which they can play. So uh, again, um, save yourself some problems. Do not allow them to take toys on the bus. Okay. <clears throat> and then again, when boarding the bus, the child must be instructed to use the handrail. And again, I'm going to stress that it is very important from the first day that you get him used to that idea or get him used, get him into that habit of using the handrail very important okay and of course then we follow uh, COVID-19 seating procedures okay from the very first day <coughs> the child uh, is assigned a seat and must be taught how to buckle and buckle him or her herself every single day every single time gets in the bus okay uh, driver and monitor must make sure everyone is clear of the bus before continuing the route okay continue conducting the successful route we already went through these uh, three or four three items here um, the bus driver and monitor must know how many children are in the bus at all times and also know where they are seated. seated. Uh, you can make, I believe there's a chart at the centers in which, uh, you know, you just list the child, make a list of the child as, as, as to where they're sitting in the bus. So, uh, again, it is very important. Okay, and there is a couple of videos there. Uh, final bus monitor video it uh, shows you how to um, other other centers uh, do their monitoring uh, the bus monitor uh, works uh, how she d handles her how how she handles the procedures uh, they differ a little bit uh, from what we do uh, in the manner of which they do them but they all do the same thing. They they are looking for the out for the safety of the child. They all uh, have the forms they need to fill out. They need to know exactly how many children are in the bus. 
uh, seating arrangements, uh, seat belts, everything. It's, it's everything else is the same. Okay, and again, there's a little note there. Control plus click on the title to start the video. Hello, and welcome to the Bus Monitor training video for the Head Start Early Head Start program. Safety of the children and staff is a fundamental component of the program. It is important that all staff be knowledgeable and develop practices that ensure the safety of children who are riding on our buses. The bus monitor is responsible for maintaining the safety of those who take the bus to and from the center. The goal of the bus monitor is to assist the driver in picking up and delivering the students safely. There are two sections to this video training. The first part shows the steps involved in picking up students and delivering them to the center. The second part shows what happens after school when the students are taken back home. There will be a review after each section to highlight the main points of the training. You, the bus monitor, will start your day at the center waiting for the bus to arrive. When the bus arrives, conduct a pre-check inspection with the bus driver to make sure headlights, turn signals, and brake lights work properly. Once that is completed, get on the bus and turn over the This Bus in Use sign at the back of the bus. As the bus arrives at the pickup locations, use the bus sign-off form to record the pickup and drop-off information. This form is very important because it tracks the child at each step from pickup to drop-off. The bus sign-off form has the names of all the children using transportation in the class. When the bus arrives at a stop, record the time in this column, and the parent of the child will sign in the row of their child's name under this column. After the time has been filled out and the bus has stopped, hand the clipboard to the parents to sign. The parents give the clipboard to the driver when they're done. While the parents are signing the clipboard with the driver, assist the children one at a time to their seats and securely buckle them in. There are two types of buckles that might be on the bus you ride. The first one is the easy on. It buckles by slipping the child's arms through the blue shoulder belts, then buckling the top latch and lower latch. The second one is called Bessie. It is secured by passing the center strap between the child's legs, then securing the right and left shoulder latches. One of your most important roles as the bus monitor is maintaining a safe environment while the bus is in motion. It will be your job as the bus monitor to help the children keep their hands and legs inside their seat area, keep noise level low, and assist any children that are upset or need extra help. These are the steps you follow until all the stops are completed and the bus arrives back at the center. When the bus pulls up to the center to drop the children off for school, the teacher will be waiting. When the bus stops, the children can start unbuckling themselves, but they are to stay in their seats until their name is called by the teacher. When a child hears their name, help them get off the bus safely. As the final child leaves the bus, check every seat for children that are sleeping or hiding, or for items that may have been left behind. This double checking of seats is an important step in making sure that every child is safely off the bus. Conduct a pre-inspection check. Turn the bus in use sign. Record pickup time on the bus sign-off form. Assist children onto the bus. Buckle each child securely. Maintain a safe environment while the bus is in motion. On returning, assist children in unbuckling. Help children off the bus when their name is called. Double check every seat for sleeping or hidden children or items left behind. We will now cover part two of the bus monitor training. After school, the children will walk out to where the bus is waiting, enter the bus and turn the this bus in use sign at the back of the bus. Outside the bus, the driver will call roll. The children will enter the bus as their name is called. While the bus is en route, continue to maintain a safe environment where the children use inside voices and keep their hands and legs inside their seat areas. As the bus arrives at the drop off points, record the time on the bus sign off form. Hand the parent or parents the clipboard and assist those children whose parents are there to pick them up. The bus driver will check the identification of the parents or caretakers to make sure they are on the emergency forms. If there is an issue with an ID or emergency form, the bus driver will alert you before you let the child off the bus. If all the IDs are checked, assist the children one at a time off the bus. Follow this routine until all the children are dropped off. When the last child is dropped off, call the center to let them know that all the children have been dropped off. Check all the seats for any sleeping or hidden children or for any items that may have been left behind. At the end of the route, the bus driver will drop you off back at the center. Walk out with the children and teacher. Get on the bus before the bus driver starts calling roll. Assist children to their seats and securely buckle them in. 
maintain a safe environment while the bus is in motion, record the time of arrival at the drop-off point, hand the clipboard to the parents, be aware of any issues that might come up due to identification or emergency forms, assist children off the bus, call the center after the last child has been dropped off, double check behind and under seats. As a bus monitor, you fulfill an important role in the success of children in the Head Start Early Head Start program. Thanks for watching this Head Start Early Head Start bus monitor training video. All Head Start children are required to wear a safety vest when boarding the school bus. The vest is easy to put on and can be resized as needed throughout the year. The child steps through the leg straps, pulls the vest up and onto the shoulders. A zipper in the back closes the vest. Children are taught to enter and exit the bus using the handrail for safety. Once children have boarded the bus, an instructional assistant will attach the safety vest to an H strap, which is connected to the seat. This strap attaches with clips to the shoulder and side areas of the safety vest. Seat belts are not needed with this bus safety vest. The H strap holds the child securely in the seat. All buses are equipped with an emergency cutter. This cutter can and should be used to cut the vest straps quickly in an emergency situation. While traveling on the bus, all children are taught to stay in their seats and keep their hands, head, and other objects inside the bus. Bodily injury can occur if the children do not follow this very important safety rule. Seat belts are to remain fastened and children seated until the bus comes and completes the stop. Then the instructional assistant will release each clip from the vest. Bus drivers must be able to hear outside environmental sounds such as emergency vehicles, horns, and trains. Therefore, children are taught bus safety signals. One safety signal is turning on the interior bus lights. The lights act as a visual signal for all students to sit quietly. Another safety signal is when the driver holds up his or her hand with two fingers extended like a V shape. This signal means no talking. Again, these visual signals are for everyone to get quiet immediately. Children are expected to learn and follow the bus safety signals quickly for the well-being of everyone on the bus. Each year, two emergency evacuation practices are required for all Head Start children who ride the bus. During these practices, emergency exits are pointed out to the children. These emergency exits are the front and back door of the bus, a window on each side of the bus, and two ceiling vents that can be used for evacuation purposes. Students are also instructed how to create two additional exits, should they be needed in the case of an emergency. The front windshield of the bus and the back door window can be kicked out creating escape avenues. Next, students are given instructions and practice on how to exit the bus using a cross pattern. This exit pattern is used so children move quickly and orderly off the bus. Children practice the cross pattern dismissal using both the front and back door. This helps to better prepare children for an emergency situation. The children are instructed to wait at a designated safety spot once they leave the bus. If your child becomes afraid he's on the wrong bus or doesn't recognize the adult that is there to pick him up, he needs to tell the bus driver. Remind your child that the bus driver has his address, parent's name, and phone number. The bus driver also has a radio to contact the bus garage or school for help and additional information. An adult is required to pick up the Head Start child. Parents fill out an emergency card with the names and numbers of all designated adults who have permission to pick up their child. Adults should be prepared to show photo ID before the child can be released. If an adult is not at the bus stop, the child will be taken back to the school and the parents contacted. Another very important aspect of riding the school bus is learning to cross in front of the bus. Red lights on the bus will be flashing and the crossbar will be down in front of the bus as children make their way across the street. However, even with all the flashing lights and signals, some drivers are distracted and fail to stop. For this reason, children are instructed to stop wherever they are when they hear the bus horn. It signals danger. After hearing the bus horn, it is important for students to watch the bus driver for hand signals informing the child when it's safe to continue crossing. Please understand that children are told to never chase a paper or anything else that drops or that is blown away when they walk away from the bus. This could lead to a terrible accident. 
The bus driver will talk to a parent or teacher if needed to explain why something got lost. A child should not get into trouble because of a missing paper. The safety of our children must come first. Please talk with your child about the privilege of riding the bus, practice the safety rules with your child in your car, and discuss the importance of following all the bus rules for everyone's safety. Welcome aboard. Okay, we're going on to unloading at the center. So we've picked up the last child and we are on our way or we're already at the center. So we're going to go run through the procedures of what we normally do uh, when unloading the, the kids at the center. First of all, the driver must secure the bus when at the center before initiating unloading procedures. If you recall that we discussed or briefly discussed a b bus roster, this is where it comes into use. Uh, we have to make a roll call and each child must respond appropriately when their name is called okay off off the bus roster uh, that way they we ensure that we know make make a notation as to who is riding the bus that morning or that particular route and uh, how many children we have in the bus okay again it, it's another check as to the amount of children in the bus uh, the number of children is verified by driver and monitor by comparing counts and both might agree uh, driver calls a roll and he marks each child present or absent therefore uh, he can determine how many kids we have in the bus okay and uh, that is why it's very important that each child responds to his name or her name when it is called okay and of course the monitor has her own count as to how many children are she sit seated or she loaded in the bus and how many children are in the bus and where are they sitting so she has her own count also and they must they both must agree as to how many children they have in the bus okay if they don't come up with the same number they got to recount and you know until they do make absolutely 100 percent sure of the number of children in the bus okay at this point the monitor exits the bus to help the children off the bus okay once the monitor is down on the ground uh the bus driver starts unloading the bus as per COVID procedures um, he starts at the front of the bus first and works towards the back okay now when they are getting off the bus of course the, they must be instructed again to be sure to use the handrail okay uh, if they should trip <clears throat> and they will trip coming off the bus it'll be uh, it'll be a longer and harder fall than when they're getting on the bus for sure okay because it's they trip up at the top of the stairs it's a long way down so yes they must hold on to the rail and they and again they need to get into that habit every day okay once the children are off the bus driver and monitor must verify the children count once again okay um, they both need to count the children how many children are on the ground and they must come to an agreement they must have the same amount of kids that they started up with when before they started unloading the bus they must agree if they don't have the same count means that one of the child's one of the kids got under a seat or the driver missed uh, getting one of them off the bus and they have to recheck again okay the driver physically verifies that no child is left inside the bus okay when uh, the driver goes park the car the the truck after unloading the kids he must he must uh, check to make sure that the bus is empty now the bus has a has a a feature there when the bus driver turns off the bus there's a loud alarm system that goes 
goes off in the back door, you know. He turns off the key, the alarm goes off, and it's going to stay on unless he goes back there and disarms it, okay. So that way he is forced to go back to the bus again and so that he can check the bus one more time, one last time to make sure no one is under the bus. But believe me, people, you do not want to forget a child in the bus for any amount of time, okay? Even if it's for one minute, if both of you are off the bus, that child can be considered forgotten in the bus. And consequences are very harsh for that infraction there, you know. It's an automatically, uh, you're fired, you know. If you should forget a child in the bus. And hopefully, if you do, the child does not, is not harmed in any way because it, it then you get into problems with the law. Okay, the Child Protective Services and all those people. So please count and recount and double count. Make sure you know how many kids you have under your uh, under your care, and always make sure exactly how many kids are are in the bus and off the bus, and make sure. I cannot stress it enough. Make sure no one is left behind. Okay, afternoon routes. <clears throat> um, once again, it is important to start routes on time. It always important to start your routes on time. Okay. Um, on the afternoon routes, the closest child to the center is dropped off first. Okay. Uh, this eliminates the this eliminates the having to have the child go all the way out to the furthest point and come back and drop him off again when he's next to the center. So drop the closest child to the center is dropped off first. Okay. Important, you must make sure the child is being dropped off at the correct address. Okay, this is very important and it's possible when at the beginning of the school year that you're not too familiar with the route, you're not familiar with the area, and uh, might be that you made a mistake and you stopped at the wrong house, you know, not knowing or not being familiar with the route. So you need to make sure the address is correct. Do not drop them off at somebody else's house. Monitor must get off the bus to assist the child with un uh, unloading the bus, okay? Uh, offloading the bus. Individual signing the child out must be authorized and have a picture ID, <clears throat> okay? Uh, so here you are at the bus stop and you're it's a new route, it's a beginning of school year, you're not familiar with anybody, okay? So just by looking at the person, you, is he a parent, is he a guardian, or is he an authorized person, okay? You don't know. So you need to go to the black box, get the authorization form. Um, the, again, the authorization form is what the parents filled out when they make an application. And on this form, they're given, they list people they're authorizing or giving authorization to receive their child or put their child in the bus in the morning or receive them in the afternoon, okay? And this person must have a picture ID on him or her, okay? If he is on the authorization form, you don't know him, You they need to have a picture ID with them so you can verify who the person is. If he's not in the form, in the authorization form, I mean, no, you can't leave him with the child, okay? If he is on the authorization form and he does not have a picture ID, no, 
you cannot leave him with the child. You cannot leave the child with him either. Okay, because you have no idea who he is or she is. So you, what you need to do is take the child back to the center, call the center, and let them know why you're taking them back, and so they can start the process of having somebody go pick up the child at the center. Okay, but again, make sure that whoever is signing the child out is authorized and has a picture ID okay okay monitor must maintain control of the child until he or she is signed out okay up until the time that the parent or our guardian signs the child out from school or you know uh, puts her signature that she's taken custody of the child again we are responsible for him or her <clears throat> if um, if you um, you need that's why you need to get off the bus to have better control of, of, of the child if you let the child go you're still up on the bus and you let him go you said okay you know help him off the steps and what do you think is the first thing he might do? The first thing he might do is he's going to run. Okay, he's home. He's happy to be home. He might have some siblings there waiting for him. What are they going to do? They might run off. They might run around the bus. They might run out to the street because you don't have any control. You're just let him go. And guess what? He's still signed in to the Head Start we are responsible for them uh, the best thing to do is get off the bus have the child get down the steps of course uh, have them use the handrail again and make them stop at the first step right down the very first step on the bus and you hold them there you control them there until the parent signs them out once the parent signs them out you turn him over to her or him. You know, here's your child. Thank you very much. We had a good day. He had a good day. He did good. Whatever report you want to give the uh, the parent, you know, here he is. The parent is now in charge of the child. If the parent wants to let him go, you know, it's her prerogative. But while he is in our custody, we need to take control. Of, we need to have control of him. Okay, <clears throat> if he is taken back to the center, the child is taken back to the center, of course, uh, referring back to the nobody being there for him, he cannot be la left at the house. Okay, A driver and monitor make sure there are no potential hazards around the bus before continuing the route. Once again, you know, make sure that you check around the bus. Uh, make sure that the, the child didn't uh, drop a paper. Make sure that he didn't blow under the bus. You know, make sure that he didn't get try to get under the bus and try to get it out. You know, make sure he didn't go to the front of the bus and look at the little butterflies that are stuck on the grill. You know, thing that little kids might do. So, yes, be very careful. Okay. It's better to lose a paper than lose a child. Okay. So be careful with that. Now, there are no exceptions. No exceptions are to be made regarding these procedures. Okay. Uh, no exceptions. If the parents are not there to receive the child, when the bus is there and you take off, you cannot leave them anywhere else. You know, uh, and it it, it it will happen. And you take off. There's nobody to receive them, and you take off. Uh, maybe a couple down, a couple blocks down the street. You know, you're gonna have a car that's honking at you. You know, honking at the bus. Beep beep beep. And guess what? It's a parents. But 
making an authorized stop or making a stop there at that particular point is not on the route. If they're not there, sorry, they have to go back to they have to go to the center and pick them up. Okay. Um, if the parents are not going to be there, they have to make arrangements. They they either need to call the center. We're not going to be at the house. Keep my child at the center. I'll go pick him up at the center. Okay. Or uh, I'm not going to be if they're not going to be there. They have to make arrangements to have an authorized person to be there waiting for the child. Okay. They cannot say, well, I'm not going to be there, so but you can take them over to my sister's house. She lives three blocks from there. No, because that is not your route. No, you're, you're going to be out of the route. Okay. And that's why you do not make an exception, because the first time they're going to get into a habit. Oh, you know, it's okay. We won't be there. They, they can take them to my sisters. And, and and they'll start doing that more often than you would like. So in order to avoid that, don't make any exceptions. Okay. At all. Okay. Now we're going to go into the uh, pedestrian safety we're going to talk a little bit about this also, and we, it might be a little repetitious because we might have already gone over some material on the uh, transportation part of it, okay? So, always, always cross at the intersection of the street so cars can see you, and always cross at traffic lights, okay? Stay on the sidewalk when waiting to cross the street, not on the curb or, or or in the street. You know, if you're not on the sidewalk, there's so many things that happen can happen when you're out out in the street waiting to cross. Okay, I don't know if you've seen some YouTube videos where there's a guy or there's a person, you know, a quarter of the way through the street waiting to cross and waiting for traffic, and all of a sudden. There's a crash and one of the car veers out and, you know, the person finds himself or herself running for their lives, you know, trying to get out of the way. Um, I wouldn't like to be in that position or that situation. I'm sure you wouldn't either. So it would be a lot safer to wait on the curb or wait on the sidewalk to cross the street. Okay. <clears throat> walk bites across the street for better control and then again I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen the videos where there's a guy coming down on the bike as fast as he can you know dashing to, towards the intersection and you see a car that's coming and they can't stop and the, the person on the bicycle can't do anything other than you know he's gonna get hit but if he's on a bicycle, you know, he's not going to dash out into the intersection at a fast rate. And, you know, and he'll be have plenty of time to look out for oncoming traffic. And he'd have better control of, of the situation. Never cross behind or in front of cars or buses. Drivers can't see small children blocked from their vision you know and, and it's um uh <clears throat> it's true you know children are small you cannot see them over the hoods of the cars you know it's common sense and if they dash out of the car you know the driver is almost upon them it, it they're impossible to avoid you know so be careful do not allow kids <clears throat> to cross from behind cars or or buses or, or in front of cars or buses. Practice crossing the street with children. Teach children to look both directions twice. Walk, don't run. Okay. Uh, 
they need to look both directions left both directions left and right and they need to walk if they see a car coming and they feel the need to to run it's a no-no because they're trying to the car is too, oh, too close okay it's better to wait until the car goes by or if they run and they trip and fall and there's a car coming they might not have enough time to get up and start running again you know so uh, teach them that it's always best to walk hold hands with children when crossing the street of course uh, also it's common sense you have better you have complete control of what they're going to do uh, they won't be able to run out in front of a car or uh, in a different direction pedestrian safety when out and about <coughs> <coughs> excuse me teach children to get an adult when a toy lands in the street not to rush into the street <coughs> You know, in the first place, I don't think a child should be playing out close to the street. Uh, you know, it should be out in the backyard somewhere. But anyway, uh, it is always uh, good to uh, teach the children that they need to be careful when they're they're in the proximity of a street and tossing a ball or you know dribbling a basketball. They always have the possibility of it rolling out in the street and they cannot just run out and try to get it because they could get themselves in harm's way make it a rule for children not to play behind parked cars including those in the driveway you know uh, it's very difficult to get into a situation where you know oh you know my kid you look at him and he's okay he's in the driveway you know he's playing in the driveway he's not in the street but playing in the driveway can be very dangerous also you know uh, somebody can come out and uh, they're in a hurry and or you know they're thinking about something other than driving and they get in the car and they start backing up and they can hit a child you know but he was okay you know he was playing in the driveway but it's not the safest play to play. That safest place to play when when at the house. Children should not walk on the inside of the sidewalk when walking with an adult. Here I believe that the inside of the sidewalk is the street side of the sidewalk. Okay. So when walking with an adult, they need to be walking on the outside or you know out towards uh, the yard side of the sidewalk not the curb side okay <clears throat> teach your children about bike safety rules and uh, practice and role model these safe tips with your children okay transportation and pedestrian safety uh, some of these uh, entries here uh, enforce some of the other uh, some of the conversation we had earlier uh, in this presentation uh, children should be dressed and ready when the bus arrives at the stop the driver will not wait if the child misses the bus it is the parents responsibility to take the child to school okay um, as I mentioned before route times are very route consistent route times are very important okay they the way they know exactly what time the parents know exactly what time the bus is going to be there okay every day <coughs> and the, the hits our bus cannot wait more than one minute uh, while while at the uh, at the bus stop okay they cannot and we're not allowed to use the horn to alert the, the parent that we're there for the child and remember that I said that um, the buses have a backup alarm you put that bus in reverse and it sounds gives off a, a shrill a very loud uh, buzz and uh, the 
the driver can kick that bus in reverse and make that make that buzzer go off but they cannot use the, the horn okay so uh, if you keep consistent route times you're going to get to the bus stops almost exactly at the same time every single day you know if you're you pick up the chicken child at 7 15 and you have consistent route time believe me you'll be there at 7 15 every single day and that way the parents know exactly what time to be ready when a child is returning to the bus stop the parent or an authorized adult must be there to receive and sign out the child if no one is at the stop to meet the child the child will be returned to the center and it will be the parent's responsibility to pick up the child okay we already discussed that earlier if there's no one waiting for the child you need to take them back to the center not a few blocks down and let him let him off over there two blocks down because the parent was late no back to the center <clears throat> it is absolutely necessary for a child to cross the street um, um, I'm sorry if it is absolutely necessary for a child to cross the street to get on or off the bus he or she must be accompanied by an adult and must cross within 10 feet from the front of the bus okay as I said that we don't allow any children to cross the bus to get to the uh, to cross the street to get to the bus okay we try to avoid that at all costs but if there's a situation in which we cannot do it uh, or design the route that uh, to pick up the child on the service door um, it have to be approved by the manager it have to be approved up here by the officer and the uh, the director transportation director that we can cross the child okay and before crossing it is a monitor's duty to get off the bus we have a handheld stop sign that the monitor must use to cross the child we have a vest in each of us the monitor must use that vest at all times uh, it's a traffic vest it's highly visible and um, if the child needs to be crossed uh, be uh, need to cross the street the monitor will be doing the crossing with him okay transportation and pedestrian safety continued okay all passengers must remain seated and wear restraints at all times okay once the child is in the bus uh, and they're buckled in they're not allowed to unbuckle themselves while the bus is moving and uh, and of course again the monitor will be the only one allowed to move around the bus and that is when it's only absolutely necessary <coughs> in case of emergencies the bus is equipped with a radio and immediate assistance can be dispatched to the location stay out of the danger zone next to the bus where the driver may have difficulty seeing you once again remember the danger zone is about 10 feet all the way around the bus the front the back and both sides okay if a person or you get in in that zone the driver will have difficulty trying to see you take 10 giant steps away from the bus and stay and out of the danger zone okay take 10 steps away from the bus and out of the danger zone 10 steps <coughs> 10 giant steps uh, for the children that's about 10 feet and you know until you see the driver and the driver sees you okay get out of the danger zone until you see the driver and the driver sees you if you can see the driver's eyes that means that he can see you never crawl around or under the bus 
okay and again remember we talked about you know if a child uh, loses a paper blows under the bus at all costs we need to try to stop that child from getting under the bus you know that's so we never crawl under or around the bus stay out of the injured zone at all times okay Toys should not be sent with a child. Items brought from home should be checked with the bus monitor. Uh, should the child be required by the uh, Head Start Center to bring any items or <coughs> material from the house, they must be checked in with the monitor. Okay, the monitor. Uh, needs to put them under the seat <clears throat> or at the at the very back of the bus there's a there's a space between the seat that you can put uh, eye chest or you can put some things in there uh, behind the seat but nothing should be obstructing the aisle or the doors or the exit doors okay so uh, it is against the law to have anything in, on in the bus aisle um, because of emergency it, it they'd be on the way when children enter the bus they must sit sit right away and remain seated facing forward they must keep their hands arms and head inside the bus at all times <clears throat> 